Welcome to Emmanuel Church Marlborough. My name is Reuben and I serve as the pastor here. We're studying this afternoon Revelation chapter 5 in the Bible. And if you haven't yet read it, please press pause now, read Revelation chapter 5 and then press play again. Our big question this afternoon is this, who has the right to roll out history? We're looking to our government at the moment to roll out a plan to take us through these dark times. And we're thankful to them for that. Uh, we're also thankful that the Prime Minister and indeed the Prince of Wales have recovered from their illnesses. And yet even those illnesses were a reminder that our leaders are vulnerable as we are. Um, and there's much good they can do and we honour them. And yet no mere human being is ultimately in control. We are all at the mercy, to quote another Prime Minister, of events, my dear boy, events. So who can roll out history? The great news is that God has a plan. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1, can you see it? it? Says this, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. God has this scroll, a plan. Uh, last week we were with John's disciple Jesus, uh, sorry, Jesus' disciple John, an old man, uh, looking in a vision into the heavenly throne room. It was amazing. And he saw there a throne because he saw that God is king, that God is in charge. And that was very encouraging. And even better now we find here that God has a plan. This scroll, a rolled up piece of paper, it's a picture language for God's plan. It's good news. But who has the right to open it? Got here um, some of my diaries, um, lots of diaries from the past few years. You see my diaries? Here they are. They're rather tatty um, because I've used them a lot. Um, they're full, they're very full actually of stuff. Um, some of them more full than others. There we go. Uh, not because I'm particularly busy, but because uh, there's not much that I remember very well, so I write it all down. Now, God's plan is very full, not because he's forgetful, but because he's got a lot to do. It says here that his scroll has writing on both sides, but the problem is it's sealed up. And the big question is, have a look at verse 2, would you? I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who? Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Who has the right to roll out history? Who has a plan that's big enough to deal with sadness? Remember, um, much of what's here in Revelation is picture language in detail. And remember the 3D glasses, which we can use to, to look at the picture language and to make it suddenly leap out of the page like colored dots with the colored glasses. Remember the glasses is the Old Testament, the ancient scriptures. And so what does this scroll mean? Well, if you check Ezekiel chapter two later in the Bible, you will see that God's scroll contains words of lament, and mourning and woe, words of sadness. Who would have the right to unroll this scroll of history when history is so full of sadness? The classic question, how could a good and wise and powerful God let us hurt? And the sadness that we will see next week in chapter six, it will hurt. Who's got the right to roll out history in a way that's big enough to deal with sadness? And who has the right to roll out history in a way that's big enough to deal with sin? To deal with sin. So you put on the Old Testament glasses again. Uh, come hundreds of years before um, to Zechariah 5. Check it out later. And you'll find there that God had a flying scroll. Uh, not a flying carpet. Uh, a flying scroll. And as this scroll goes out over the world, it declares judgment over people's sin. Serious. But who would have the right to roll out history in such a way as would deal with sin and with sadness and even with death? As H.G. Wells said, if there is no afterlife, then life is a sick joke braying across the centuries 
who would have the right? No one except Jesus. Jesus, the lion lamb. We're going to spend most of the time on these two big points, the lion and the lamb. First, Jesus, he's the lion in verse five. Can you see verse five? Then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and his seven and his seven seals. Brilliant. Who has the right to roll out history? The lion does. Picture a lion with a uh, huge and golden we feel his mighty mane. Hear his awesome roar like in the MGM Hollywood video. But who is this lion of the tribe of Judah, this root of David? Well, again, with those 3D Bible glasses, he is God's promised king. Remember King David, who ruled in Jerusalem 1,000 years before Jesus. Now, King David, his great, great, many great grandfather was called Judah. And way back at the end of Genesis, God called Judah a lion and said that he would have a royal line with a scepter. Well, Judah's great, great, many great grandson is King David. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised David that one of his great, great, many great grandsons would be not only son of David, but also son of God, the everlasting king. A thousand years later, Jesus was born in David's town, in David's line. And Jesus triumphed over sin and sickness and storm and Satan because Jesus is the lion, God's promised king. The lion has the right to unroll history. It's good news. So let's be humble. He has the right because he rules. So let's be humble. You'll remember that in C.S. Lewis's um, stories about Narnia, uh, Aslan is a lion and Aslan represents Jesus, actually. And the children ask, uh, is Aslan safe? Is he safe? And the answer comes, of course he isn't safe, he's a lion, but he's good, I tell you, he's the king. The lion has the right and we must be humble before him. Isn't that good news? Imagine the daily uh, news briefing comes from the government and they say, frankly, we haven't really got a clue, no idea, do what you like, doesn't matter. That would be bad news, wouldn't it? Thankfully, the government is giving us a good lead. But Jesus, the lion, he gives us the greatest lead. Human leaders may fail, but Jesus' plans are always right. And we need to be humble before him. Maybe sometime you'll come across part of the Bible, God's words that uh, doesn't, well, you struggle with it. Maybe it's different from what most people say today, or maybe it demands quite a lot of you. We need to be humble before God's word. Jesus is the lion. Who has the right to roll out history first, the lion? Now, there we are. We're in the heavenly room, throne room with old man John, and we hear the lion roar. And we turn around, we're expecting to see this amazing, mighty lion. And what do we see towering over the throne? What do we see, verse 6? Then I saw a lamb, a lamb, looking as if it had been slain. It's very strange. The lion, the lamb. Uh, they're not two different things. They're the same person. They're both Jesus. Jesus is clearly neither lion nor a lamb. He is the God man. But it's picture language. He is the lion and he is the lamb. So who has the right to roll out history? Jesus, we've seen first he's the lion, so he rules. Now, secondly, let's see, he's the lamb, so he redeems. The lamb who redeemed, this is verses 6 to 10. Now, countries choose for their kind of symbols big, fierce, powerful animals. Um, so the British rugby team is called the Lions. The England football team wears three lions on the shirt. Uh, the USA, their symbol is the eagle. Uh, the Russia symbol is the bear. Countries choose big, strong, fierce animals for their symbols. 
by the kingdom of God. Their symbol is a lamb. Now this must be picture language because uh, Jesus is actually the God man. He's not actually a lion or a lamb. He's the God man. Um, and because of curious things here, like the fact the lamb has seven uh, horns, meaning he's perfectly powerful, uh, seven eyes, meaning he can see everything by his Holy Spirit. And yet he is the lion and he is the lamb. Very strange. Uh, what is the biggest shock in verse six? What is the biggest shock? Look at verse six again. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. This mighty lamb, the biggest shock is that, well, though alive, it looks like it's been killed. The one on the throne bears scars. Just as Jesus, the risen Jesus in all his glory, showed his disciples the wounds, the scars where the nails had gone. Jesus is the lamb. Now, why does that give him the right to roll out history? Well, on the one hand, it means that he can sympathise with us because he's he's one of us. He's hurt with no much more than us. The story is told of a crowd of angry people before God's judgment throne. And they say to God, they say, hang on, God, before you judge us, we think you should try something. We should think you should try being like us. See what it's like. We should think you should have um, what a dubious kind of a birth and you should uh, try being homeless. Let your family think you're mad. Let your friends betray you. Be convicted of a crime you never did. Be tortured and die. And then when you find out what it's like to be one of us, well, then you can judge us. Hmm. Silence falls. The crowd begins to drift away because they realise that Jesus ticked every box. The lamb can sympathise with us. But more than that, he can roll out history in a way that deals not only with sadness, but also with sin. Because not only can he sympathise with us, wonderfully he can also redeem us. The lion rules, the lamb redeems look at verse 9 would you verse 9 and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for god persons from every tribe and language and people and nation you are worthy because you were slain and with your blood you purchased you redeemed you bought people for god not with money but with blood. What does that mean? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That means that our wrongdoing costs something. And we ought to pay God for our sin in his judgment after death. But God loves us. So God came in the person of Jesus and Jesus paid for our sins when he bled and died for us instead of us. The lamb redeems, he buys back. And that is what gives him the right to roll out history. There's this race, isn't there, to find a vaccine or, um, or a cure for the new coronavirus. And when they find that, it'll be so precious. And yet the cure for sin is as free as it is priceless because it is the blood of Jesus. If you're not a Christian, why don't you ask God for that cure today? Let's be sure that we've said sorry to God and asked him for his forgiveness. The Lamb redeems. Well, let's be hopeful. Let's be hopeful. It doesn't mean to say that we'll suddenly be helicoptered out of the problems of this world and float through life on a cloud of marshmallow. But it does mean that Christians get to reign as the princes and princesses we were made to be. Look at verse 10 with you. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. But we get to reign as lambs, like Jesus, little lambs. They're his big lamb, if I may say that. We get to reign by serving, 
even if it costs us our life, because that is the model he gave us. Well, let's look for ways to serve practically in this crisis. Whether that's shopping and prescriptions for an elderly neighbour, or giving financially to help with the response to the coronavirus in maybe poorer countries. And let's look for ways to serve spiritually. Did you see in verse 8 how precious our prayers are to God? As they're presented sweet smelling in golden bowls. How precious they are. Maybe you feel like there's little you can do. You're frustrated. You'd love to do something to be helpful, but you can pray. That is the most helpful thing you can do. And as we pray for God to save people from sickness, let's also pray for God to save them from sin. And since the Lamb redeems people from every tribe and language and people and nation, then let's pray for the world. I hope the coronavirus prompts us to give to charity abroad. Or maybe give to Christian charities, which can offer people both life and eternal life. Uh, Zoom to our Coffee Central uh, meeting this Thursday. We'll be hearing more about the Christian response to the coronavirus in the majority world. Let's reign like the lamb. For as someone said, the person possessed of these qualities, though poor and powerless, has the dignity of Christ the King. Who has the right to roll out history? Answer, the lion rules. The lamb redeems, rules, redeems. And very briefly, as we close, let's respond. And this is verses 11 to 14, though we'll just touch down in it. What a scene this is at the end of the chapter. Perhaps the greatest scene in Revelation or even in the whole Bible. Imagine them maybe uh, on a pitch at the centre of a great stadium. And there is the throne at the centre of the pitch. And around the throne, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, and they're praising Jesus. Hear them singing, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. And in the stands of that stadium are many angels, verse 11, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they're singing, verse 12. They're singing, worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise, worthy. But now the camera zooms up, like in Google Earth perhaps, and we see the crowds in the car park, and the crowds in the town and in the countryside, and the crowds in verse 13. Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever.